Hello, everyone. So, artificial intelligence. The concept has been around for decades, and the last two years has been the period of, I think, unprecedented hype. I don't know uh, exactly how it started, but I am dating it back to the moment where uh, Google announced that AlphaZero managed to beat all human chess grandmasters. I think this is the moment that started the AI hype that now makes every vendor or almost every vendor claim they have some AI solution uh, for my problem. Later, we also learned that uh, different neural network engines were able to beat humans at Go and at different computer games. I think two days ago, uh, I read some, something about StarCraft. And my take on this is the following. It is impressive, but is it really that useful? And it got me thinking two years ago. Uh, this is actually when this presentation uh, started, at least conceptually. It got me thinking, what would be, in my personal opinion, a useful AI use case? And I realized it would be reading. A very common skill that seems to be easy because virtually everyone on Earth uh, can read. That would be a very useful skill. So, can computers read the way uh, humans read? I am Marek Jankovic. Uh, I am working for Roche, uh, which is a Swiss uh, healthcare company. And uh, we have, in Poland, we have offices in Warsaw and Poznań. Uh, I came here for, uh, from uh, Poznań. And I've been working there for uh, more than eight years already. And during this time, I, I was doing different things, but it was always related to data. So I started as an ETL developer, then I was a, a BI developer working with front-end solutions, then it was uh, Hadoop, and now I'm a Python developer and an aspiring data scientist. I'm not a data scientist yet. And I would like you to leave this talk excited about the possibilities uh, natural po language processing gives you today and will be able to give you in years to come. Uh, that's why I will start with a demo of things you are able to do using natural language processing today. And then I will go to my vision. I will describe uh, what I am uh, awaiting for very eagerly. And then I will compare and contrast my vision with the current state, stage uh, of research in this uh, area. But as I said, there will be a quiz. So let's start with a quiz. Uh, I would, uh, uh, this quiz is here to show you how much work our brains are doing when reading. I will be showing you snippets of text, and then two answers. You can shout the correct uh, answer, or you can raise your either right or left hand to vote for the answer. Uh, if there is any Bob among the audience, Bob, this is not about you. Uh, so, the first snippet says, My friend Alice is a great developer. Unfortunately, Bob isn't. That's simple, right? It's not said explicitly uh, in the uh, sentence, but we know that the meaning here is the fact that Bob is not a great developer. The other one, Charlie can already write, so he must be at least six. Two possible answers. He's either six years old or six feet tall. Okay, we know it, it, somebody is talking about uh, his age. Almost the same sentence. Charlie plays basketball, so he must be at least six. The same two answers. Is he six years old or, old or six feet tall? What's more probable? Again, it is not, yes, exactly. It is not, it is not stated explicitly uh, in the sentence, but from the context, we are able to derive additional information. When someone uh, plays basketball, they are usually tall. So this is the correct answer. One more, this time a dialogue. So, uh, how did you like the Canary Islands? It was nice, 
sunny, not too humid. The water was a bit cold, though. And again, two answers. What was cold? Water in the ocean or water in the shower? Yes, exactly. Although the sentence does not mention either ocean or shower, we know that someone is talking about the ocean. Let's use a song. I love music, so let's use a song uh, as an example. So uh, this is the, these are the beginning lines of Beatles' Textman. Let me tell you how it will be. There's one for you, 19 for me, because I'm the Textman. Two possible options. So the Beatles were required to pay a 95% tax, or altogether there were, there were 20 forms to be filled. What is this song about? This is getting harder. This requires integrating some additional knowledge. But this song uh, has a meaning. These are not ram ran random numbers. Uh, th that's the correct answer. And yeah, that was the re reality for the Beatles in the 60s. I'm not making this number up. And why does it say 1 and 19? Well, before uh, 1971, one pound was subdivided into 20 shillings. So it's actually one shilling for you, 19 shillings for me. Another song, Cheryl Crow this time. She was born in November 1963, the day Aldous Huxley died. Are we able to tell uh, when the baby girl was born? I think nobody in the room knows this exactly, but we are able to find this information. We are able to integrate external knowledge. Because we know uh, who Aldous Huxley is, or at least we suspect he's somebody famous, so we Google him. Okay, Aldous Huxley died on November the 22nd. If we go deeper, that's the same uh, day President Kennedy was assassinated. So there's a high probability that the baby girl and the mother did not receive uh, the attention they uh, deserved that day. Everyone was glued to the TVs and radios. So when we are reading, when we are processing text, we are actually doing a lot of work that we don't realize. And it is really an impressive skill. Even if you think you don't know what natural language processing is, you use it on a daily basis. There are many areas, so there's the area of syntax, and here are the low-level building blocks like, like lemmatization or text segmentation. I will demo, demo some of them uh, later. But then you have, you have speech processing. So if you are using, I don't know, a GPS on your mobile device and you are asking for directions, and your device is giving to you directions, you are using speech recognition and speech generation. And these are areas and tasks of NLP. Then we have uh, semantics. And here we have uh, tasks that you probably know very well, like uh, OCR or machine translation, or natural language understandings that powers the chatbots. And why I believe it is important? Well, because over the history of humankind, we learned to talk, and we keep talking. And no matter how much we love numbers, no matter how much we love computer code, uh, we still uh, talk to each other, we write, and we read. We also publish an awful lot of research papers. So. Uh, as I said, Roche is a healthcare company, so as an example, I took PubMed, which is, which is a database of uh, life science, sciences and biomedical journals, but this is not all the content that is published, and I am talking only about publicly available content. So in, t in 2017, uh, they had uh, 800, more, more than 800,000 citations uh, indexed seems to be a lot, or maybe not. To put it into perspective, that means uh, 2,000 articles every single day, including Saturdays, Sundays, holidays, every single day. Uh, what basically means that only a small fraction of available uh, knowledge and data is used when uh, 
doctors or IT specialists are uh, making decisions. And this, this gives us uh, suboptimal results in uh, research, in uh, drug development, in patient treatment, and software development as well. Because PubMed contains, for example, uh, articles about uh, NLP processing of medical uh, data, of medical records. Do you think I have time to read all these articles? Sadly, no. Let's, uh, let's switch to a demo. The code samples are in uh, Python. Uh, and I will be using a library called Spacey. However, the concepts I will be showing uh, can be applied to, to any programming language. The Spacey library ships with a number of uh, pre-trained models. They are prepared for uh, different languages, and depending on uh, the, on your use case, you can either choose a small model that will be fast or a slightly larger one that has more capabilities but is slower. Uh, I am choosing a medium model uh, for English. And uh, I will talk about uh, parts of, part of speech tagging, uh, lemmatization, dependency parsing, uh, rule-based pattern matching, named entity recognition, and I will finish with uh, word embeddings. And this is a selection of features of the Spacey library that are also available in other NLP libraries that you can start using right away. So this is not uh, cutting-edge research. Uh, these, these are things that are already uh, available. And they are actually very useful. So let's start with uh, part of speech uh, tagging. So there is a sentence. Then I am initializing a, a spacey document, which is basically a list of tokens with different attributes. And here I am using an attribute that is called part of speech. And I am printing this. So this tells us that, for example, the word sky is a noun. And uh, another noun is the word color or television. Uh, but we also have uh, a verb here that is the word to be. That is not terribly, terribly useful by itself, although you could use uh, this simple method uh, to analyze uh, service reviews to learn what adjectives your customers are using about your service. Uh, do they say, say the service is poor, ter terrible, excellent? This is a simple way to extract all the adjectives that, uh, that are used uh, in some text. Uh, you are free to take uh, all the photos you want. I will also share all the materials later. So up to you. Uh, part of speech tagging is also a building block for lemmatization. So we have a piece of text here, it, a fully artificial piece of text. I wanted to make my point. So we have a sentence like, she goes for a walk every day, he was going to the cinema in the evening, and so on. And we want to find all the occurrences of the word go. And as you, as you can see, they appear in different forms. So there is goes, going, gone. So lemmatization takes different inflected forms of nouns or verbs or adjectives and converts, converts them to the dictionary form uh, of the word. And as a result, Again, I am doing exactly the same operation. I am converting text to a spacey document and then iterating uh, over it tokens. But this time, instead of the part of speech uh, property, I am using the lemma property. And if I print it out, the algorithm is able to uh, show me uh, every go word, even though it appeared in past form tense or present continuous form. So this is what uh, lemmatization is about. Let's move on. Dependency parsing. So uh, the sentence this time is, Bob, Bob never took chemistry in school. I'm not sure about you, but during my grammar lessons in primary school, I was drawing many uh, diagrams uh, like this, many sentence diagrams. What we see here? So we see, we, we know, uh, again, we see the 
POS tags, so part of speech. This is a verb, and this is, for example, a proper noun. But we also know what role they play in the sentence. So Bob is a subject, and chemistry is an object. And we also see that we have a negation here. Again, not terribly useful by itself, but it is a building block for something else, pattern matching. So, uh, another snippet of text, and this time these are snippets taken from uh, audit protocols. Inspectors come uh, to Roche fa facilities, they perform audits and they describe their findings, and we want to analyze these reports in bulk, finding all the negative events. So, for example, uh, here it says, most are not fully documented. So not fully documented is something we are interested in. This is, we don't want uh, to have this happening. But we have thousands of reports and observation uh, notes written over the year. What do we do? So Spacey contains a class called Matcher, which basically allows me to create patterns and then find them in documents. So uh, I am looking for uh, negated verbs. So I know I am looking for a verb, I, am, I know I am looking for a negation followed by, uh, by a verb. And negation may mean the word not or never or didn't. There are different ways to negate a verb, so it is not obvious. I am running this. Okay, it is able to tell me that this, te this text contains two negated verbs, not implemented and never discussed. Good, but I can also see not fully documented. So I can extend the pattern. I can set that between the negation and the verb, there may be an optional adverb. So if I add this to the pattern and run it one more time, this time this pattern is able to locate more phrases that are uh, interesting for me. OK, next, next thing that is possible is named entity recognition. And depending on how you prepare your model, how you uh, train your model, you will be able to find different entities. Usually the models that are ready for you are able to find uh, names of people, geographical locations, things like that. Let's have a look. So uh, this time the sentence says, two days ago, Marek Grzankowicz flew to the DevOps conference from Poland. I am running a slightly different snippet of code, but again working with a spacey document. And I know that two, two days ago is, an, is a date. It is an expression of a date. It is not a precise date, it is a relative date, but it is still a date. Marek Jankowicz is a person, which means that this model cannot rely on a hard-coded dictionary of first and last names, because simply there are too many uh, different names in different languages and it was able to find mine. It also is able to recognize that DevOx is an organization. Okay, close enough. And Poland is a geopolitical entity. And it is able to recognize uh, more entities, more are built in, for example, monetary values. But you can also train your own named entity recognizer if you want to find, uh, I don't know, uh, some uh, molecule names in documents, or uh, disease names, or if you are in a completely different industry, maybe there are terms that are important for banking or insurance that you want to be uh, looking for. All this is possible. Uh, for some things you have uh, re readily, available model, readily available models. Sometimes you need to train your own model. And the last thing I, I want to discuss are word embeddings. So you might have word, you might have heard about BERT. Sorry, you might have heard about BERT uh, because this is something that Google recently introduced in production. They claim it changes 10% of uh, search results. So this is a contextual language model. Uh, Spacey for now using uses an older concept, uh, which is a context-free uh, language model called GLAF. But Word embeddings are basically 
vector representation of words. Because if you have a machine learning algorithm, it always expects number. It cannot process uh, words directly. So there must be some way to represent words as numbers. Word embeddings is one of these ways. So uh, I will be using the word dog as an example. Uh, so first of all, I will print this vector. And to be precise, I will print uh, the first 42 elements of this vector. So it's a vector. It is a sequence of, uh, it is a sequence of numbers. Uh, let's see some basic statistics about this vector. So the, the vector contains 300 elements. So if we have a vocabulary of words, uh, each word is, a, is encoded with a, with a vector that consists of 300 numbers. And you can use them uh, to fit into machine learning algorithms. They have some interesting properties. So you may compare words by checking the angle between the vectors. 300 elements means that the vectors are uh, in 300 dimensions. Obviously, I cannot draw it, so it's a huge simplification. But if we have two vectors like dog and husky, they are related, so the angle between them will be small, which means that the cosine of this angle will, will be close to 1. So if words are similar, their, vector, their vectors are oriented in uh, more or less the same direction, which means small angle between the vectors. And we can use this uh, property to compare the vectors. So I have a sequence of words like this. Dog, husky, cat, horse, tree, stone, and bitcoin. I think you can see where I am going with this. So I will uh, process uh, this list of words uh, in a loop uh, to calculate the cosine similarity of those words. So the word dog and dog are the same words, so uh, the, the angle between them is zero, so cosine is one. And then we have pairs of words that are less and less similar. Uh, Bitcoin, for some reason, is the least similar word uh, to dog I was able to find. No idea why. Probably if we took a different collection of text to train the model, if we took a collection of text that discusses uh, some uh, sellers of dogs who also accept Bitcoin payments, uh, these two words will start appear closer in, in, the, in, this, in these texts, and therefore they will become somewhat similar. Because word vector, vectors are trained on co-occurrence of words. So this is purely statistical uh, calculation. If we have a large corpus of texts, hundreds and, uh, and thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of pieces of text, and we train word embeddings, uh, an, algor an algorithm looks and, at how often and how close the words appear to each other to see if they appear in the same context. If they appear in the same context, their vectors uh, will be pointing in more or less the same direction. If they never appear in the same context, the vectors will, will be pointing in opposite direct directions, so the similarity becomes uh, negative. you can do uh, vector arithmetics. Vector arithmetics you know from maths, or from algebra, you can also uh, perform on word vectors. Here I am uh, creating a helper functions, which you may be able to uh, analyze closer later. What is important is that this is a function that accepts a vector and returns similar words. It returns vectors that are close in the word space to the given vector. And I need this because I will try to create uh, completely new vectors. Let's test it. So I am uh, again using dog as an example. Let's see what are words similar to the word dog. OK, so we have canines, dog, puppy, poodle. The function sh seems to be working. It is able to retain a list of similar words. Uh, I don't want to be using dog throughout the entire presentation because you will later tell me that these are, this is useful only for a single word. So I also printed words uh, that are similar to the word spring. 
and we have summertime, summer, autumn, winter, seems reasonable. These are words related to the word spring. But this also shows an important uh, limitation of word embeddings. Context-free models are not able to distinguish different meanings of the same word. And spring is a season, and, but spring is also a metal coil. Uh, you can have in a bike, for example. Uh, and that means that if a word has different meanings, it is still represented by a single vector. That's a limitation uh, one needs to be uh, aware of. OK, back to vector arithmetics, and I will be now able to use my function. Uh, so there are two vectors. There is a vector for the word parent and the vector for the word mother. I am adding these two vectors together, and I am getting a new vector x. Who is willing to take a guess? What word is closest to x? Almost. It is about family, but uh, a woman who is a parent is a mother. And this is actually the result of this uh, calculation. And other words that are related, so the next result is child and girl. So exactly as you said. So another example, because we can also subtract the vectors. So I have seawater, and I am subtracting salt from seawater. What is the result? Very good, and you are faster than spacey. So congrats again. Uh, it is water, but as you can see, it is also air. So you need to import, remember, this is not precise mathematics. It is only about moving a vector from one direction and reorienting it into another point of the vector space. Probably uh, when we have articles that mention seaside and seawater, they also, also praise the gentle breeze and fresh air. So sea, seawater, air often appear in the same context. So from the statistical point of view, they are related. OK, let's take a harder example. And uh, let's simplify this equation. And now, what's, what's the vector x representing? No, it's not Roche. Yes, it's representing the capital city of what? Yes. Uh, so this is what happened. Actually, uh, Switzerland min minus Basel encapsulates the concept of a country. Some country, we don't know what country. And then we can add a city to this new concept, and then the can a country becomes the country. In uh, this case, if we add Poznań, that is located in Poland, to the general concept of a country, we get a particular country that is Poland. OK, so uh, this. Why Sweden? As I said, this is not precise mathematics. Uh, so uh, for some reason, in the corpus of text that was used to, to train these embeddings, uh, Sweden was appearing uh, often in the same uh, context. So to understand this, and this uh, becomes, for example, discussion about uh, data bias, you need to analyze closely the data set you are using to train your model. Because if the data set is wrong or if the data set is biased, you, you will start getting uh, wrong results. So I, I cannot exactly answer exactly why Sweden, but uh, yeah, the good point, it is still some country, which means that we were moved to the uh, section of the vector space that is related to, to countries. So I will run out of time, so we will uh, check afterwards. But if a word has multiple meanings, then the vector describes the meaning of the word that, uh, that is most common in the, tech, in the data set you are using to train the model. So as you saw, uh, the word spring uh, was related mainly to seasons. 
but if you take a completely different set of text and train the model, and this text will be about bikes, cars, mechanics, probably the spring will mean the, the metal coil. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 this is an important uh, limitation to keep in mind. Okay, let's switch to slides. Because this is what is uh, possible. And it is very useful, and I am using this uh, in my daily work. I am implementing projects uh, using the, uh, these methods. But I am not fully satisfied. So what I would like to see, and this will be a bold vision. This is a vision, it may be bold. So uh, the first use case I have, uh, I called tailored reading recommendations. So let's say I am starting a completely new project, and it is a very novel project. This is something uh, I have never done before, and I have a feeling that it will require some uh, reading some research papers, uh, because it is so new that I don't know any library that I could use. So I have a document, a text document, let's say a one-page document, that in natural language, for, written for me, describes the requirements from the, for this project. So I would like to have an algorithm that is able to read this project description, then read thousands of articles that may be related, and then give me a short list of reading materials. By reading the project description and by reading the articles, find the ones that are relevant. So we need an algorithm that is able to actually understand the text uh, that it is reading. Another example, and this is actually a, a project uh, use case that I implemented last year. This is my vision. What was implemented was significantly simpler text analytics solution. Uh, but Roche has different facilities around the world. These facilities are audited by inspectors from different agencies, and they write audit protocols. These are usually multi-page documents. Uh, we also have some uh, observation notes written by uh, Roche employees, and we also have uh, inspection forms, which is a kind of document published by FD FDA about different companies. So uh, every such document is read, every such uh, document is addressed. If there are some corrective actions to be introduced, it is done. Uh, so that's good. But at the end of the year, there is a management meeting, and for the management meeting, someone needs to prepare a one-slide executive summary. So someone needs to go through hundreds of documents and compile a list of the most common risks that were mentioned in the documents uh, during the last year, and also the risks that are uh, emerging. So they are not so common, but we never saw them in the past, and now they start to appear. So again, I am looking for an algorithm that is able to read these documents and not only use uh, keyword matching, but by actually understanding the text, the text prepare this executive uh, summary for me. Uh, one more use case, one more project that I am currently uh, finishing using machine learning, but I would like to be able to implement it differently. So our diagnostics division is producing uh, instruments that are installed in hospitals uh, all over the world. And uh, we have a, a support service for them. Customers call us or email us and have different complaints. We have specialists who have a, a complaint handling manual. So it is a written document that is 50 pages long or so. And they read this document to be able to flag the complaints that are major complaints. They are either potentially reportable incidents or potential safety issues. So uh, PRIs and PSIs mentioned at the bottom. So we have trained specialists who read every ticket and flag the ones that uh, require special care. Again, I would like to have an algorithm who, who is, that is able to read exactly the same manual that is prepared for humans then take a list of new complaints that were filed and tell me which of them are PSIs and PRIs, but without me coding the rules for the algorithm. I would like to have a reading comprehension algorithm who can work with the same manual that humans are using. So as I said, bold vision. 
Where are we with this? Let's look at the state of research. But I need to start with a definition of uh, reading comprehension. So uh, reading comprehension is the ability to uh, process text. This part is easy. Computers can do that. Understand its meaning. Okay, it's getting harder. And integrate with, all, with what the reader already knows. And it means with what the reader already knows about the world in general, about their domain of work, and also about what they read five pages earlier. And this uh, last step is really hard. By the way, this definition is applicable both to humans and computers. That's the same definition uh, of the skill. So what are the fundamental uh, requirements uh, for reading comprehension? So the algorithm must understand the meaning of words, and it must be able also to guess the meaning of new words from context. We are able to do that, so we need a computer to do that as well. Uh, we need to be able uh, to have an algorithm that is able to identify the main thought of, the, of a passage and an algorithm that is able to answer questions about the text that was read. And this is actually, actually how we teach uh, children to read. We give them a short piece of text to read and then we ask questions. What was, who, who was the story about? What does this person do? And so on. The algorithm must be able to recognize the literary devices used in the text, because not every piece of text can be uh, understood in its literal manner. Uh, the author may be joking, the author may be sarcastic, the author may be uh, making things up. So the different things uh, can happen in the text. And last, probably the hardest, uh, is the information integration. The algorithm must be able to process the text, and while doing this, integrate uh, real-world knowledge and integrate also uh, common sense. For the purpose of this presentation, I picked uh, three research papers. And what they have in common is the fact that they consist of the actual publication, a data set, and a leaderboard. A data set is important because so far all the reading comprehension algorithms are very complex and very advanced machine learning solutions. Uh, so we have a data set that, compare, that contains the train set that scientists can use to train their models and a test set that is later used to benchmark the uh, algorithms against each other. And the leaderboard is a uh, usually public leaderboard that allows the teams uh, from around the world to compete against each other. I will be talking about these two uh, papers in more detail. So squat, uh, there were two revisions, uh, that's why there are two versions of the data set, but squat contains more than 100,000 question-answer pairs, and all these question-answer pairs were extracted from only uh, 500 Wikipedia articles. So uh, don't try to read this whole uh, text. I will be highlighting the important pieces. But the task the algorithm is given is the following. This is a document. So they are, us they are usually short, a few sentences. This is a document, and this is a question. What is the usual source of heat for boiling water in the steam engine? And the task of the algorithm is to read the document or process the document, uh, process the question, and highlight in the text a span of text that is an answer to this question. Is it a complex, complex task? It's not trivial, but we are doing harder things on a daily basis. But this is what uh, Squad is testing. So it is giving short snippets of text, a question, and the algorithm needs to highlight the answer. And in this case, the answer is here. So uh, the algorithm wins if it highlights burning combustible materials. How good are algorithms at this? Actually better than humans. And uh, what's interesting is that this research paper was published in 2015 or 2016, and the researchers are still using this. 
because the best model I found on the uh, leaderboard was published uh, last two months ago. Uh, so computers are slightly better than humans uh, at this task. But I am not fully satisfied. This is not a complex, complex task. So first of all, the uh, diversity of topics and vocabulary is very limited. Only 500 Wikipedia articles. I used a model trained using this data set for different Wikipedia articles. So I took a model, I took a few Wikipedia articles discussing Roche products, and I asked questions about Roche products. I don't know, one in 12, questions, 12 answers was correct or, or something like this, less than 10%. So this is not a model that uh, generalizes well. It works well for the selection of articles that is in scope of this data set. The documents are short. So uh, there, there are not even the entire Wikipedia pages. There are paragraphs of text, the paragraphs of text, which makes the task uh, easier. Each answer is also a, is always a span of text from a single document. So there is no integration of knowledge. There is no integration of uh, pieces of information from the first sentence as, and last sentence. The answer is always a span of three, four, five words. And sometimes uh, the algorithm does not really have to understand the text, and it may only use some uh, pattern matching, because if the question is, what is the capital city of Poland? The algorithm may look for the capital city of, of Poland is and take the first word that goes after this. It may be enough to answer some questions. So this data set is not really testing the actual understanding. So I find that, found a different one. Narrative QA data set contains uh, 1,500 documents, but this time they are books or movie scripts not snippets, not chapters, entire books, entire movie scripts, and it also uh, contains uh, 45,000 of question-answer pairs. So, uh, obviously I could not fit this on the slide, but in the data set, the document is a full uh, movie script. And then there's a question. What is the fatal injury that Jacob sustains, which ultimately leads to his death? And again, the algorithm has to highlight, uh, has to answer this question. And the answer is a bayonet wound, but it is harder because in some, at some point of the script, we learned that Jacob was wounded, and only later we learned that he died because of that. So this time we have uh, some knowledge integration, only within a single document, uh, but uh, there is some knowledge integration. These are the results from uh, two years ago. We were significantly better than computers. Uh, all these metrics uh, were taken from uh, machine uh, learning, uh, machine translation algorithms. Uh, higher is better. And they basically tell us how similar uh, the actual answer is to the expected answer. But let's see what happens uh, after two years. I would say it's a tie now. So uh, this, the models are getting significantly better when processing this particular data set. However, there is still, still no integration of external information. So every answer is fully contained within a document, within a book or within a movie script. It may be scattered through the document, but it's there. The progress is impressive, in my opinion. Uh, I, I think it was even less than two years uh, when, in some metrics, the algorithms are becoming better than uh, humans. However, again, these are models that don't generalize well. And this is actually a caveat of using uh, leaderboards. The research teams are highly competitive, and they want to uh, occupy the first spot on the leaderboard, so they fine-tune their models uh, to perform well for a particular data set, they have no incentive to uh, train uh, general models, if only uh, leaderboards are considered. So there are some critics lately uh, of this approach of using uh, leaderboards in general. Time to summarize. 
So uh, two, two, two weeks ago, I was scrolling through my Twitter feed and I saw an article that said, machines beat humans on a reading test. And I was, uh, my heart skipped a bit because I was, does it mean I am preparing a completely new presentation uh, for DevOps? So I took a deep breath and read the article. So indeed, I missed an, an important uh, data set that is called uh, Glue. However, uh, the remaining content of the article confirms my thesis. So the algorithms that were trained using BERT uh, and evaluated against the Glue data set still have possessed no real understanding of, of the language. We love standardized tests because we are able to easily compare the models against each other. But there are standardized tests, which means that the models that are very good at finding hidden patterns uh, learn, learn to cheat at them. And for example, they may notice that it is beneficial to always choose an answer that contains a negation, because these are usually correct answers. This not, does not show that we have a reading comprehension algorithm. We have an algorithm that was good at, at finding this particular pattern, uh, which means that all the data sets uh, must be very carefully checked for uh, bias and repetitive examples. Because if they are there, the models will find them and will exploit them and will score very good at, uh, at the test. So uh, the response to this was creating new uh, data sets, for example, Superglue, uh, with examples that are designed to be very hard for the models to process. So, yeah, it, it, it's a competition, us versus the, the algorithms. Who, who will uh, outsmart who? And we can uh, go back uh, to my uh, initial question, to the question that was the title of the presentation. So in my opinion, at the moment, we have no algorithms that would be even close to the way uh, humans are reading. Not yet. It will happen. It may happen during our lifetimes, but what we have so far are very advanced, very sophisticated machine learning algorithms that are achieving very good uh, scores in the standardized tests, but so far, they have no uh, actual understanding of the text they are processing, and they are tailored uh, very closely to the data sets. The, 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 we have no, the, there is no sign of a general reading comprehension uh, algorithm. If that was interesting, uh, there's a link at the bottom. You will find the slides there, you will find the Jupyter notebook there and tons of links uh, if you want to explore this topic deeper. Thank you very much for, for coming. For, th thank you very much for your attention. Who wants to ask the first question? Can we build some model in which uh, words with uh, same uh, writing uh, will have uh, uh, different representation as a vector, for example, using uh, uh, two uh, different uh, languages and translation of uh, words and in a such way receive uh, vectors with mm -hmm. some uh, distance between them. So models like this already exist, and this is, for example, BERT or ELMO, and these are the contextual uh, uh, language models, then they don't rely on representing a single word as a vector. They rely on building as a, a representation uh, of a word in the context of the few words that are surrounding this word. That, that, yes, it, it is possible. Uh, it is done. As I said, Google already uses BERT in uh, production. It can be done. Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, is some uh, languages is uh, is uh, easier to uh, automate or okay, I understand. Uh, it's not depend on. So uh, when you are working with 
rules that were manually crafted, then yes, some languages are easier than uh, other languages, uh, and therefore it is easier or harder to uh, create the grammar, rule, grammar rules manually. Now, when NLP switched to machine learning, it is all about finding a large enough uh, data set that is annotated, manually annotated. Because if you are training a named entity recognizer, it means that you, have, you need to have a collection of texts when someone manually highlighted, this is a person name, this is a location, and this is, for example, I don't know, uh, some monetary value. So if you are able to uh, create a data set that is large enough and of good quality, you will train a model for, uh, for any language. But this is machine learning. Uh, so the challenge is always the size and quality uh, of the data set. And this is true for natural language processing. This is also true for uh, image processing that, for, uh, that uh, Ola presented er earlier. The challenges are the same. Uh, for this last test with Project Gutenberg, it was a lot of books for input. Yeah, who prepared those data sets with answer, and what was the approximate duration? Yeah, it was it done with computer or it was pure manual work to prepare this. It is manual set. work. So uh, I'm not sure about narrative QA. Uh, I, I I don't know the precise process here. I mean, I don't remember it. I'm sure it is described in the uh, research paper. But in case of Squad, I can tell you that. The way it works is they used Mechanical Turk. Humans are, were given this uh, snippets of texts. Humans were given the question, and they were asked to highlight the answer. And each piece of text was processed by three annotators. Uh, two answers, uh, at least two answers, had to be exactly the same to include uh, this example in the data set. But if only two are correct, and the third one was a different, then this was counted again against humans' performance. So this, is, this was uh, an example document that humans got wrong. This is how the comparison between uh, computer-generated answers and humans' answers was calculated. But Squat was pre prepared fully manually for uh, every single uh, Q&A pair, three annotators. So it is a large effort. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one more time, I will uh, stick around. The materials are available. <laughs>